Well, I'm real honored and humbled to be here, and I'll try and be as eloquent as Mr. Wilcox was. But I want to get right to it because I only have about 40 minutes, and there's a lot of information. So let me start off by saying I just recently spoke at a school. This was the youngest and brightest students, and I started off by saying, how many people have heard about George Washington? Every hand went up. And then I said, how about Paul Revere? Everybody goes up. Then in the corner, all the hands go up. When I said Joseph Warren, about six hands went up. And this is what initially brought me to the project. And I'll try and explain throughout the course of this why he's been forgotten and why he fell into such obscurity. And I hope he's making a little bit of a comeback. But to start, I want to just give you a little bit of background. So, Dr. Joseph Warren was president of the Massachusetts Provincial Congress. He was head of the Committee of Safety. He was Grand Master of the Scottish Rite Masons in all of North America. He delivers two Boston Massacre orations. He authors the Suffolk Resolves. He dispatches Revere and Dawes on that famous midnight ride. He's involved in every major insurrectionary event in Boston, from the Stamp Act crisis to Bunker Hill, but yet, if anyone remembers him today, I mean, he's, he is remembered in Massachusetts, but once you go further south, people do not know who he is. They don't recognize the name, and if they're lucky, they'll remember him as the guy who sent Paul Revere in the night ride. Now, in order to start the story, I feel like I almost need to begin at the end before we can get to the beginning, and that's at the centennial celebration of the Battle of Bunker Hill in 1875. Now, this is a huge moment because they're not just celebrating the Battle of Bunker Hill and Joseph Warren and the soldiers who gave their lives at Bunker Hill. This is a healing moment in the country because it's the first time since the Civil War that Northern and Southern troops are marching in unison. About 350,000 people descend on Boston. So this is really when Joseph Warren reaches his unit, and there's, there were a lot of clues at this centennial celebration. And one of the things that brought me to this project, every history book, every piece of literature for the past 150 years has said Joseph Warren's direct descendants are extinct. And in fact, they are not. They boast an impressive military line, and I won't get into this, but the interesting thing is, at this centennial celebration, Joseph Warren's great grandson was at was there, and he met General William Tecumseh Sherman. And General Sherman was responsible for his appointment to West Point. He set him up with the politician, the senator who appointed him. Now, the direct descendants, I think there's seven West Point graduates, but I'll get into that a little bit later. But here's just another picture. Let me just say this. I think one of the reasons the Civil War has become more popular than the American Revolution is just because of a lack of pictures. It's almost, we look at these revolutionary characters and it's just paintings. It's, it's not really tangible. So anytime I can get a picture of something from the Revolution, I get very excited. Now this will show you, this is how many people were descending on this parade in 1875. And I like to joke around and say it was, it was more people that showed up for the Red Sox World Series parade. Okay? <laughs> So this, if you see to the left, right here, I have my trusty pointer. Right there it says Joseph Warren. On this side it's where he, but it was a, it was a triumph mark that people marched through. But again, this is when Joseph Warren reaches his zenith. After 1875, is the descent into obscurity. Now, this is a mid 18 mid 19th century sketch of the farm Warren grew up on. Okay. His father was a selectman. He was a Roxbury apple farmer. Now, when you look at all the primary sources, the documents, by all rights, you think Joseph Warren should have become a loyalist. And I will explain why. So one of the questions I had when I came to the project is, why did he cast his lot with the Patriot Ways? Now, there were two events I traced back that we really didn't know about. One was called The Invisible World. This was a book written by Joseph Warren's maternal grandfather, and it came out against the Salem witch trials and the powerful Mather family. Now, he had to get this published in England because nobody in the day colony would publish it because the Mather family was so politically powerful. Now, a lot of historians have pointed to this and said, if this book had not been published and written, that Salem witch trial hysteria would have spread to Boston. Now, this was passed down in generations to Joseph Warren. He would have known about this. And it just shows you that 
one of his ancestors stood up against some of the most powerful families in the colonies. Now, the second incident was called the Land Bank. This was in the late 1730s, early 1740s. There was a scarcity of coin. And so what a lot of landowners did was they print paper money that's backed by real estate by land. Now, when the wealthy merchants get wind of this, they reach out to Parliament for help in dissolving this land bank. One of the principal owners of this land bank was Samuel Adams' father, Deacon Adams. Now, Parliament dissolves this land bank and it financially ruins Sam Adams' father. And a lot of historians have also pointed to this saying, this is why Sam Adams came out so vehemently against Parliament and it mires him in debt. But what we didn't know was Joseph Warren's grandfather was also one of the most principal investors in the land bank and he is financially ruined. When you look at the primary source documents, the newspapers, he is selling tracts of land, farm animals, personal possessions. He's begging for relief because this has absolutely devastated him and ruined him. Now, this would have been the first instance where Joseph Warren is personally exposed to Parliament dipping their hands in the colonists' pockets, and it stayed with him. And this would have also been another common denominator between him and Samuel Adams. And this is another question I had. What was the relationship between Samuel Adams and Joseph Warren? Read any history book and all they'll tell you is, well, basically, Warren enters the Whig faction and Samuel Adams molds this blank piece of clay. It's not true. Now, Warren's family puts a premium on education. He goes to Roxbury Latin School in Roxbury to prepare for his degree at Harvard. He goes in July 1755, takes the oral examination, passes the test. Now, this is the president of Harvard at the time. Now, Warren enters as a freshman. At the time at Harvard, class ranking is based on the social standing of your parents. So it's as if I went to you and said, how much money are your parents worth? Oh, they're not worth that much or they're worth a lot, so you'll be ranked number one. Joseph Warren ranks 31 in a class of 45, so he comes in at the bottom of that social battle. Now, he's also 14 years old. He's one of the youngest students at Harvard, so he's already at a disadvantage. Now, this ranking stays with you throughout your four years. In his freshman year, there's tragedy on the farm in Roxbury. Joseph Warren's father, at the height of the apple bars, is picking apples, falls from a ladder, breaks his neck, and dies. Most histories have told us Warren was at Harvard when this happened. He wasn't. The primary source records at Harvard show that Harvard was closed. Warren would have absolutely been at the farm in Roxbury helping his father. So this might have been one of the instances that pushed him towards a career in medicine. Now, I just want to make you aware, when I, when I started writing this book, there is literally almost no primary sources left about Joseph Warren. He didn't have a diary, there was no journal, we don't have the benefit of the letters between a John and an Abigail Adams. So it was challenging to say the least. I spent 20 years on this project and I actually moved down to Colonial Waynesburg because there are such experts in the material culture and the scholarship that they really helped me throughout this project. Now, I mentioned Warren's direct descendants. Meeting them, they opened up a treasure trove of material culture pieces, which also have not been in the public eye for centuries. This is a Warren Russet apple tree. You can get the apples here, they're called the Warren Russets. So you can see that at maturity, these trees grow to about 30 feet high. This tree is at one of the direct descendants farms in Virginia. When I went there, she starts pulling out art. Artifacts, material culture pieces, family trees, it just allowed me to deconstruct this project in a way that had never been, been done before. And it just opened the window on Joseph Warren's life. Now, part of the problem has been this sort of glass half empty approach to the Warren scholarship, right? Well, there's not much on him, we can't tell much. Even his own biographer, in 1961, Joseph Warren's biographer writes, a personal belletristic biography of Warren cannot be written. This book is solely intended as a new look at his public life. So it really was my mission to try and find out, really dig, this, dig beneath the surface and see if there was anything there. Now, Warren graduates Harvard, he leaves, and it's almost like he's leaving this social and educational oasis and he finds himself back at the farm in Roxbury. Now, he becomes a teacher at his alma mater, okay? 
and he begins his medical apprenticeship with Dr. James Ward. Now, why is this important? Okay, so at the time, if you want to become a doctor in the colonies, there's no medical schools. You either have to apprentice with a physician who's already established, or you have to go to the glittering capitals of Europe and apprentice with a physician there. Warren chose wisely when he chooses Lloyd because Lloyd has come back several years ago from Europe with the most up-to-date medical techniques. He's championing obstetrics, smallpox inoculations. Before this point, it's just really midwives who are dealing with obstetrical care. Now, Warren's not just learning how to become a doctor. Lloyd is wealthy, he's politically connected, he's friends with General Howe, Lord Hugh Percy. So Warren's not just learning the bedside manners, the nuances of a bedside manner, he's learning how to become a gentleman, how to dress, how to entertain. And also, while he's at Harvard, he's rubbing elbows with the sons of powerful loyalist politicians, merchants, names like Hutchinson, the Hallowells, the Olivers. Now, the amazing thing is when Warren had graduated Harvard, he's rooming with the number two and the number eight scholars of his year. Now, he was ranked 31. It just says a lot about him that he was sort of able to elbow his way out of this mediocrity. And there's, and there's a whole world at Harvard that he was exposed to that really without that education, he would never have risen to these top spheres of the economic, the social, the military circles within the Bay Colony. But it's also a question, how did he do it? His father's not a gentleman, he's not politically powerful. Now, Warren at this point enters the world of masonry, and it's also because he's not in these social circles at Harvard anymore. So he joins St. Andrew's Masonic Lodge, where there's men like Paul Revere, John Hancock. And now, this sketch right here just shows you an example of the time that this is when doctors are becoming involved in obstetrical care, not just midwives. There's a horrendous smallpox outbreak in 1764. Now, prior to this, people in the Bay Colony thought smallpox was God's divine intervention, that they should not be medically treated. So this is kind of a new, audacious treatment. Now, Warren inoculates about 100 people. None of them die. It's the first time he meets John Adams. John Adams comes to Boston with his brother. Adams is inoculated by Dr. Nathaniel Perkins. His brother is inoculated by Joseph Warren. And it's the earliest description we have of Joseph Warren. Now, thus begins a lifelong friendship. And I will get into that a little bit. Now, in September of 1764, Warren marries Elizabeth Hutton Warren. Now, before this point, all we've known about her is a death notice and a birth notice. So I found some incredible pieces about her. Number one, this painting is in the Museum of Fine Arts, Boston. For hundreds of years, it's been said it was painted by John Copley, who also painted Warren's painting. It's not. This was painted by Henry Pelham, and I found this in some of the diaries of Warren's nephew. Now, some people might say, well, why is this significant? Well, it's significant because not only does it set the record straight, but Henry Pelham was also a fierce loyalist so this is extending Warren's network beyond just Whigs and Patriots. It just shows you his connection to the Loyalist population at this point. And this is why he's such an attractive character when he enters the Sons of Liberty, the Patriots, the Whigs, because not only is he a doctor and a successful doctor, he's Harvard educated, he's a gentleman, he's wealthy, and he has connections on both sides of the political divide. Now, Another thing is that a lot of historians have claimed Warren marries Elizabeth just for financial gains. And this is not true, and we'll get to that a little bit later. And I promise you, I know we keep saying we'll get to that a little later, but I will. This is a painting of John, of Joseph Warren by John Copley. It's the only known image of him, okay? Now, again, the question, why is Warren becoming a Whig? He's getting all this political and financial patriot from Governor Thomas Hutchinson. Hutchinson oversees the probate estate of Joseph Warren's father's will, so they would have known each other from when he was a child. But amazingly, in 1765, there's this horrific bankruptcy by Nathaniel Wheelwright, one of the wealthiest merchants in Boston, and it topples the Boston economy. Hutchinson incredibly appoints Warren as the administrator of the estate, which is a financial appointment. Warren had no financial background, success, anything like that at that point to deserve a commission like that. The other thing is that he's appointed as the almshouse physician for Boston from 1769 to 72, which earns him over a thousand pounds. So 
basically Warren casting his lot with the Patriot Leagues is, is really financial suicide at that point. <coughs> now, remember I said I questioned the relationship with Adams and Warren? So here was the first question I had. If you look at the spelling, can everybody hear me if I'm not right in the microphone? Okay. So look how he spells Adams' last name. A-D-A-M-E-S. Now, when you look at, this is, this is Warren's medical ledger from 1763 to 1768, and then there's another ledger from 74 to 75 in the Massachusetts Historical Society. Warren's penmanship at this time is hand copy. I mean, it is immaculate. So the first thing I had was if this was really Warren's mentor, wouldn't he have known to spell his name right? Well, a lot of people might question that, but here's the real story. Warren writes that Adams was this, the Honorable Speaker of the House of Representatives. Adams was never the Speaker, he was the Clerk. If these two men were this close in 1768, Warren would have known that. I'm not trying to knock down Sam Adams. What I'm saying is that when Warren enters the political faction, he already has his extremist political philosophies and ideologies. Sam Adams definitely helps Warren, but it's not this mentor-student relationship we've thought of in the past. It's a little bit more on an equal footing. Now, this to me was incredible because Warren's ledgers between the years 1770 and 1772 have been missing. I bought this at auction in 2008. This is a missing piece of Warren's medical ledger from 1771. Why is it significant? Well, it proves the ledgers existed, but if you look here, Christopher Monk visiting dressing. Christopher Monk was the sixth victim of the Boston Massacre who dies in 1780 from his wounds. Now, and from this missing piece of the ledger, did anybody here ever watch Little House on the Prairie? It's, it's okay to admit it. I, I watch it with my daughter. Do you remember that? I know it's not really macho, but do you remember the doctor who's going around and he's taking chickens and bacon and other things? This is what Warren is doing in the ledgers. He's taking flour, he's accepting beer. You read so many lines where it says, this account has been suspended in consideration of this person's misfortune. So Warren is not only gaining the trust of the people, he's, he's now getting a reputation as one of the best doctors in Boston. His practice is growing, people are coming to a place that trusted him with medicine, with advice, with politics. And he's becoming known as a magnanimous figure because he's helping the people. It's not just about money. Now, and again, this proves the existence of those missing letters. I mean, it really, when I found this, it was just, it was incredible that I came across this. Now, another thing we question is Joseph Warren's wealth. People say, well, every history has said, we don't know if he has a carriage. We didn't know if he had shades. We don't even know if he had a horse. So if you look at this, I found this document in the Boston Public Library. Now, we always knew that Warren had rented a house. My question was, gentlemen of this period, they were landowners, they were gentry, they didn't rent houses. I found a document showing that Warren had purchased a mansion estate in West Boston, and he hires all kinds of people to do these custom construction upgrades within the house. So while they're renting, he is building a house on the level of a John Hancock house. But look at this. This says to painting a carriage vermilion. Now, why is that significant? Well, it proves that Warren had a carriage. Vermilion is the single most expensive color in the colonies at this time, and it's in high fashion in London. You know, I joke around and say it would be like the equivalent today of somebody driving a red Bentley with a fountain in the back. I mean, the wealth is just so ostentatious. And you see this in the primary source documents of Warren's clothing, the finest silks, the finest linens. And he's on par with the wealth of a John Hancock because John Hancock also has a carriage, a carriage that's been painted vermilion. And the clothes are similar to the style and the fabric that John Hancock is wearing. Now, this is just an example. Warren also had a Berlin. This was, I believe, from 1780-something. It's in a museum in Maine. Now, why is this significant? Okay. Remember I spoke about the material culture pieces, the artifacts, the archives? This clock is in Scottish Rite Islamic Museum and Library. It's never known if it belonged to Joseph Warren. I found a primary source document proving that this belonged to Warren. So why is this significant? 
This is one of the most expensive items somebody can have at that time in their home. And it's even more expensive because it's an 8K clock, which means it only had to be wound every day as in comparison to a 24-hour clock. Now, the fact that we put this in Warren's office at the time shows that he is one of the wealthiest people in Massachusetts Bay for the fact that this is sitting in his office. And we can actually connect it to him. Now, this is a close-up of the clock. And if someone had a clock of this price at that time, it just showed that they were important enough that their time needed to be tracked precisely. Now, again, you know, Joseph Warren writes a letter in 1771 talking about John Adams, and he refers to him as a rather cautious man politically. And there was a time when John Adams retires and drops out of the Whig movement, but this is a material culture piece in the possession of Warren's direct descendants, and it's a silver porringer handle that John Adams gave to Joseph Warren at the, uh, the birth of one of his children. So usually what this was, it's, it's the handle, and there's a little cup, and that's what would usually be given at a christening or a baptism. We also found that people before this have said Joseph Warren had four children. He actually had five. One dies in infancy, and the family tree in the possession of his direct descendants actually proved that. They lost a young daughter named Mary, and they renamed their youngest daughter Mary. And this is another thing that would have connected him with Revere, because Revere is on a much lower social standing than Warren, but their wives die within a week of each other, and they both lose children. And they both come from humble beginnings, which is really amazing how Warren kind of reaches these upper echelons of, these, uh, of the Whig movement. So, Joseph Warren's wife dies in 1773, okay? And remember I said that a lot of historians claim that he married her solely for financial gain? Okay, so this is a mourning ring. This was at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and basically what it is is people wore mourning jewelry back then, and it's an urn under a weeping willow. Now, the way you differentiated mourning jewelry from regular jewelry is that black band, and so when someone died, you put their name on it, the date they died, and how old they were. So I found this crude sketch. This was a ring that Joseph Warren had made, a mourning ring, in honor of Elizabeth when she passed away. Now, this just proves that Warren would have been very wealthy to even be able to afford something like this. But if you look around here, those are 16 precious stones, which really sets it to another level. This just, again, is underscoring Warren's wealth. And here's a contemporary sketch of what that ring would have looked like. Now, I'm in touch with the direct descendant family historian, and I brought up the ring to him, and he said, wow, I remember my grandmother talking about this when I was a kid. He said, you know who has it? I said, who? He said, my cousins in Maine called him, and I called him, and they said, oh yeah, there was that box of junk from that general and it got stolen two years ago. And it was just, I mean, it was just devastating. And he, and he lamented the fact that these people wound up with the few remaining possessions of war. But I was at least happy to prove to him that this ring did exist. Now, we didn't even know where Elizabeth was buried. She is indeed buried in Cops Hill in Boston. Now, one of the things I want to talk about is I located the probate will of Elizabeth's father. When he dies a couple of months before Warren marries him, Warren and Elizabeth inherit half of what was called Hutan's Wharf. Why is this significant? Well, this is significant because this is a direct connection to Warren and the Tea Party. Because as the owner of that wharf, Warren would have been connected to that seaside populace, ship captains, he would have been there often. Now, a lot of people say Warren wasn't really connected to the Tea Party. It's not true. Yes, Warren was not on that ship dumping chests of tea overboard, but he was one of the main planners of that Tea Party. That's shown by the new evidence that he owned Hutan's Wharf. But Warren is also conducting meetings in the month leading up to the Tea Party with two owners of that ship, Captain Francis Roch and John Rowe. Both are patients of Warren's. Rowe is a Masonic brother of Warren's. And he's having meetings with them in that month leading up to the Tea Party. Now, Warren was also at Old South Meeting House the night of the Tea Party. So, there is no way that Warren was not, now, like I said, he was not throwing chests of tea over, but he was one of the main organizers of the Tea Party. And he never gets credit for it. So, as a result of the Tea Party, 
England passes the Coercive Acts, and the Boston Port Act goes into effect June 1st, 1774, which shuts the port of Boston until Bostonians pay back that tea, but this puts a stranglehold on the Boston economy. Now, at this, and I know this might be an assault on modern day notions of acceptable breathing time, but back then this was common. Warren starts to see another woman called Mercy Scully. And again, we have the same problem with Mercy Scully as Warren's wife that not much was known about her. Now, these are Mercy Scully's parents. On the left is John Scully, he's a prominent son of liberty. He was affected by that 1765 bankruptcy, but pays off his creditors and becomes a prominent son of liberty. Now, here's another thing. Mercy Scully's mother, her brother, was Warren's apothecary supplier. Now, in the Boston Athenaeum, there are volumes and volumes of medical ledgers from John Greenleaf, who's Joseph Warren's medical supplier. No one has ever deconstructed these ledgers before. I went there, and there are so many interesting things in that ledger. I mean, there are certain syringes he's buying, and when I asked one of the apothecaries at Colonial Waynesburg, why would he be buying this certain syringe? Well, sexual diseases were rampant for in Boston at the time, so he would have been treating that. He's buying choirs of paper, he's buying wine, he's buying perfume, he's buying tonics called Turlington's Balsam of Life. It just proves to you that Warren's just not operating a physician's office, he's running a shop. He's actually doing both things, and it connects him to this family through the mother, Mary Scully, and her brother. Now, the incredible thing about Mercy Scully, like I said, we don't have much on her. I found a letter from June 1st, 1774, that we never knew existed. It was misfiled in a folder. The language is so fiery and vehement that we have to put her up in the category with other daughters of liberty, like Mercy Otis Warren and Abigail Adams, because the language is so vociferous. Now, at the time, in 1774, no one's really talking about independence publicly. She's writing to her cousin saying how devastating this Boston Port Act is, and she's actually blaming King George III. Now, at this time, you're not blaming King George III. If you're going to be vocal and daring, you're going to blame Parliament, you're going to blame his administrators. You're never going to touch King George III. She's actually doing this, which is amazing, and it sort of makes sense that Warren and her would have started something. Now, if Joseph Warren had done nothing else but this next act, we would own the debt of gratitude. So he writes the Suffolk Resolves, and what these are, it's a declaration of rights and grievances against Parliament. Why is it so significant? Because he dispatches Paul Revere in September 1774 on one of his less famous rides to the Continental Congress, the first Continental Congress in Philadelphia, who's meeting for the first time. Now, as you know, sectional rivalry is nothing new to the Civil War. When these delegates assemble at the first Continental Congress from all over the colonies, they're calling their own prejudices, paranoia, Boston seen as an upstart town. Revere delivers this document, and it's adopted unanimously, which becomes a unifying moment at the Continental Congress. And I really can't underscore this enough. And that's why you'll get some people saying, well, you know, the founding fathers, they didn't know about Joseph Warren. They didn't say, no, they all knew about Joseph Warren because of the Suffolk results. And it really is the precursor document to the Declaration of Independence. I mean, when you read the language, it's unbelievable. And you, and you say to yourself, how is Warren not remembered? Even just for the Suffolk results, take everything else and put it away. Now, I don't want Paul Revere fans to get upset because I'm not demoting him from the role of history. But why do we call it Paul Revere's Ryan? It's Joseph Warren's intelligence network that actually sets off this shot heard around the world. There have been diaries that just came out published in 2015 talking about Warren being passed intelligence from certain people that, and they were directed to give it only to him. He dispatches Revere and Dawes on this ride, okay? Revere actually gets caught. When Warren finds out that eight militiamen have been killed on Lexington Green, what does he do? Founding fathers are in Philadelphia. He goes across the Charlestown River and says, where is the fighting going to be the worst? He joins General Ward in Arlington, which was monotony back then, and he's almost killed. You know how they would curl up the hair on the sides with a pin? A musket shot knocks off that pin, and he's almost killed. Now, again, you know, his intelligence, he goes out to fight, but he's 
if he's remembered at all today by people outside of Massachusetts, is that it's as the guy who sent Paul Revere on his midnight ride. It really should be Joseph Warren. Now, there were also, Revere was the one feeding intelligence to Warren as well. There's a, there's a letter we have from Paul Revere saying him and 30 mechanics were keeping eyes on British movements and reporting their actions to Warren and a few others. So here was something I got excited about. So for 200 plus years, we've been told that Joseph Warren dispatches Revere and Dawes on their midnight ride from this Green family house that he's renting on Hanover Street. It's not true. Warren leaves this house in 1772 and moves to a completely different property called the Chardon House. That's where he dispatches Revere and Dawes on the midnight ride, not from the Green House. And again, it's just, when you start piecing all these things together and you start realizing before this, we didn't even know where Joseph Warren lived. These, these discoveries are so exciting and incredible because it just gives you sort of a window on his personal life, on a man where we didn't even know where his house was. And how ironic is it that John Adams, this is a shrine right down the road here, but a patriot like Joseph Warren, we didn't even know where he lived in Boston. But now we do. This was the American house on Hanover Street that was in the 1830s where he lived. Now, again, founding fathers were at the Continental Congress. Some people have referred to this as the 60 days, right? Warren becomes the on-the-ground leader. He's almost killed at Lexington and Concord. He's involved in the battle and skirmishes at Graves Island and Nottles Island. And then at the Battle of Bunker Hill, he's nominated a major general three days before but shows up and fights as a volunteer and is killed at that battle. Now, this is Boston, 1775. This is not the miraculous victory of Yorktown, 1781. So, sometimes we have a tendency to look at these events in the 18th century with a 21st century mindset, but let's really try and put it in perspective. So this is Boston, 1775. Warren's just been killed. George Washington has been nominated general of the Continental Army three days earlier. George Washington has not been involved in a military conflict in almost 20 years. He was a colonel of the Virginia Regiment in 1758. When he shows up in Cambridge, he's going to have to, at the moment, fill Joseph Warren's shoes. Nobody knows who Washington is at that point. There's two letters that we have from soldiers who were at Bunker Hill saying, a new general arrived today. We don't know who it is. Someone else writes, a General Washington arrived. Who is this man? And just to kind of put it in perspective, John Adams had written a letter in 1774 saying, I just heard the name George Washington. I never heard this name before. So again, Washington will become Washington. I'm not trying to denigrate Washington in any way. I'm at, at, he's actually one of my favorite historical figures. But when Washington arrives, he's a Southerner. The amazing thing is that he finds out in New York what's happened at Bunker Hill, and he's disgusted when he finds out the treatment of the, of the soldiers. So John Adams, John Hancock, Samuel Adams, all dispatched letters to Joseph Warren, thinking he's still alive. And they're giving him the task of receiving George Washington and reading his charge in front of this new army. They're not, doing, they're not sending this letter to General Artemis Ward. They're sending it to Joseph Warren, which shows you how important Warren was at this time. And when Warren shows up, He's emulating Warren's battlefield heroics. He knows who Warren is. He knows he's got four orphans now and that he's dying. And a man like Washington, if his moral, his, his ethics, his character can, cannot help but emulate what Warren has just done, that he sacrificed his life in battle as a volunteer. He's paid the ultimate price. Now, to put it in perspective, the British leaders are just stupefied by this. They say, there's no way Joseph Warren went and fought in this battle. Okay? One officer says, if this is true, this is General Howe who led the third assault that day on Bunker Hill says, if this is true, Joseph Warren's death is worth 500 of my bravest soldiers. Now, the, the shame is that we have two letters, okay? There's two primary source letters that were written within months, one within days after Warren's death. One is written by Abigail Adams to John Adams saying that she ran into two deserting British soldiers, and they both said that Warren was beheaded on the battlefield, but then they said they thought it was a rumor they weren't sure. A few months later, there's a letter from Benjamin Hitchborn to John Adams saying that a Lieutenant Drew of the British Army stormed up to Breed's Hill where Warren was hastily buried 
dug him up, cut off his head, and spit on his face. Now, we don't know if that's true. I personally don't think that he was beheaded, but the problem is, is that when the British charge that redoubt and climb over that redoubt, I mean, it is a blood rage. First of all, they have watched their commanders and officers get picked off one by one on the battlefield. It's basically Patriot target practice. This battle of Bunker Hill produces more casualties at this battle than any other battle of the Revolutionary War. And when they get to Warren, he's dressed in finery. You know, I almost joke around and say, this is like Trump getting in an army tank and going and fighting in Afghanistan. Warren should not have been there. There's no way he should have been there. And he pays the price. Now, his body was definitely mutilated. I mean, it is a blood rage. I mean, they're doing hand-to-hand -hand combat. Warren is one of the last people to leave that redoubt because he's trying to cover the retreating men. They strip him of his clothing. There's primary source letters from people on both sides of the battle, both British soldiers and American soldiers, talking about when the British scaled those walls of the redoubt, any wounded patriot on the ground, they took the, the butts of their gun, started bashing in the heads of the wounded patriots, and started stabbing them with their bayonets. They strip Warren of his clothing, they take his possession, a family Bible, and to show you how important Warren was at this time, Governor Thomas Hutchinson learns of Warren's death when he's in England and says, if Warren had lived, he would have become the Cromwell of North America. Peter Oliver, another prominent loyalist, said, had Washington lived, Warren would have become an obscurity. So it's just devastating. When this happens, I don't know if we can really appreciate it today, just how devastating this loss was to the Patriot movement at this point. And again, why don't we remember Warren? So now, think about it. There's no movie stars at this time. There's no superheroes. Who are the heroes of the day? Well, it's nobility, it's the king, it's military figures. Most mezzotints or paintings in people's houses are of King George III or military leaders. So who's the, who's the hero in the colonies to this point, the military leader? It's James Wolfe, who's killed, and it's a British general, who's killed during the French and Indian War. Immediately, Warren becomes the first American martyr in the cause. Now, this is the catch-22 because He's remembered as a martyr, but this one afternoon overshadows his 10 years of on-the-ground resistance activities. And that's the shame, because if he's remembered at all today, it's as the martyr of Bunker Hill. We don't remember the two fiery Boston Massacre orations he gave, mostly. And, you know, I hope Warren is coming back in vogue and making a renaissance, because during President Reagan's first inaugural address, he mentions Warren, he talks about him from the... Boston Massacre Oration, and that's another thing. When Boston, when Warren delivers the second Boston Massacre Oration in 1775, he volunteers to do it. British soldiers are threatening to assassinate anyone who delivers that oration. You know, and again, Warren is there on the ground. It's you know, it's everything: voice, pen, and sword. And again, I'm not denigrating the founding fathers, but they're in Philadelphia, over 300 miles away. Warren is the one doing all of this. You know. He wrote a letter to the Continental Congress in May of 1775 begging them to establish an army and appoint a generalissimo, which they do. So here's Warren actually trying to guide the hands of the founding fathers in the Congress. And from this letter, we could say that he was one of the founders of the army. I mean, it's just amazing when you, when you start putting together all his accomplishments, it's just sad that he's not remembered. And this is why I got involved in this project. So this is the headstone of Mercy Stoley, and it's really sad because when you read her letters, after Warren dies, there's this really nasty custody battle between her and Warren's mother and his brothers, and she, you know, much like Alexander Hamilton's widow, she lives 50 years after Warren's death. And you'll read her letters 40 years after he dies, and she's talking about him as if he died the day before. It, it, it's, it's very heartbreaking. Now, here was another cool thing I found. So Benedict Arnold. Warren meets Benedict Arnold in the spring of 75, okay? Arnold approaches Warren and says, I want to go up to Fort Ticonderoga and get this cannon that's up there. So what does Warren do? He goes to the Provincial Congress and secures him ammunition, arms, money, and sends Arnold on his way. Now, about a week after Bunker Hill, Benedict Arnold's wife dies and leaves him with orphan children. To this point, we had thought that 
Benedict Donald gave $500 for the care of Warren's children. I found this document at the Smithsonian. So it really casts a whole new light on Arnold's treason. Look how much money he gives to Warren's children. Almost 3,000 pounds, which today is the equivalent of almost $600,000, which is which is just an oxymoron about someone who's been accused of putting money above their country. Now, there's a lot of prominent, I can't talk to you about Benedict Donald's treason with any scholarly knowledge, but there's, there's a lot of recent scholars who are sort of revisiting Arnold's uh, flip. But look when the letter was written. It's July 1780. I mean, it's literally right before Arnold's uncovered. His treason's uncovered. And Mercy Scully, this is part of a five-page letter that Mercy Scully had written to Benedict Arnold thanking him because here's another shame. So when Warren leaves Lexington and Concord, when Warren leaves his office to go fight at Lexington and Concord, he doesn't know what's going to happen. He knows people have been killed he never comes back to his office, but in the days leading up to that, he sent his children with Mercy Scully up to Worcester, Mass. He's getting rid of his possessions, so his possessions are going out to family in Roxbury, it's going out to Milton, it's going to Mercy Scully's parents in another area of Boston. And when you look at what happens after he dies, the children are destitute, they have no money, Warren's possessions are scattered and lost, and here's part of the reason we, we don't know a lot about Warren, or we didn't know much about him. In 1768, when the British arrive in Boston, he burns his personal correspondence because he's afraid of being arrested. In 1775, his nephew John Collins Warren says that Warren burns most of his personal correspondence because he doesn't want to be arrested. In the mid-19th century, for hundreds of years, there's been rumors of house fires. I located the house fires. They were in his descendants' house. There were two house fires within a period of six years where almost everything went up in flames and actually there was a colonel who lived across the street from one of the houses that rushed into the building and saved the Warren painting and the painting of his wife. And there was actually a slave child who ran in to try and get some other articles and burned in the fire and died. Now, you know, I, this was a tribute to Warren in the 1840s, showing he was still relevant. And it's, it's kind of funny because when you look at all the primary source documents, newspapers, the literature, uh, nobody's talking about Paul Revere's Midnight Ride. When, when you're talking about Lexington and Concord, it's Warren. Really, it's not until Longfellow's poem where Revere sort of yeah. overshadows Warren. Yeah. Now, these are the first presidents, the first eight presidents. Here's Washington. All these soldiers are the 13 colonies. Here's General Lafayette, and here's General Warren. So, again, it's sort of a catch-22 because Warren is still a part of the story at this time. Part of the other reason he's not as well known, both his sons die relatively young. One of his other daughters dies in her early 30s, so his sole surviving daughter, the Mary, who they named after the daughter who had died early in her childhood, she has the one sole surviving son that all the direct descendants today can trace their roots to. Now, before this, we've known that John Warren, his brother, was a founder of Harvard Medical School, Mass General, there's nine generations of Harvard doctors, but again, when I started researching this book, I didn't find the direct descendants, I think, until it was about 2010. And there's about 30 of them. There's a close-up of the Joseph Warren from that. Now, this is his nephew, Dr. John Collins Warren, who was really a prominent figure in helping to try and secure Joseph Warren's legacy. He was a member of the Bunker Hill Monument Association. This is just his picture on, on his, with his hand on a random skull. But, again, Joseph Warren, right. well they collected these, I mean, I contacted a company and they said they were responsible for moving most of his collection and, he, and they told me that about six people quit the moving job because there were things that were pickled and all kinds of weird things that were, you know, in vogue at the time to be collected, but the, this is a daguerreotype image of Warren's skull, now how do we have this picture? Okay, so. Warren is one of the most migratory corpses of all the founding fathers, right? He's killed at Breed's Hill in 1775. In March of 76, British evacuate Boston. Warren's brothers go over to Breed's Hill, identify the body, they bring him to King's Chapel. He's buried in Old Granary in the tomb of a friend. In 1825, he doesn't, they don't even remember where he's buried. His nephew, John Collins Warren, removes him from old granary and puts him in an underground crypt at St. Paul's and he stays there for another 30 years, okay? 
Now, also, you can see when they took these daguerreotype images, you could actually see where the bullet hole hit them and where it exited. Now, in 1855, John Collins Warren has funeral urns made. Him, two sons, and a son in law go to the underground crypt at St. Paul's and they have a photographer take these pictures at the time. Now, I just thought this was kind of interesting. So this is a letter written by the son-in-law right after he was in that basement vault, and it says, the shape of the skull of General Joseph Warren was very like those of the Warrens of the present generation. And I just thought that was odd. Like, imagine these four guys in this underground crypt, like, comparing the skull and comparing it to the people who were standing there. But, I mean, again, these are doctors, and so now, Warren, along with his brother John Warren, they're eventually relocated to Forest Hill Cemetery in August of 1856. Now, this is the gravestone of Warren's youngest daughter. She, she dies right before Mercy Scully in, I believe, 1826, which was the same year Adams and Jefferson died. And this is in Greenfield, Massachusetts. What? Remember when I talked about the direct descendants? So. Six, six or seven West Point graduates, nine commissioned officers, six non-commissioned officers, a general. One of the direct Warren descendants has participated in every American conflict since the Civil War. And this is a picture of Warren Wildrick. He was a Green Beret Special Forces in Vietnam. He died of Agent Orange cancer. And I include this picture because I, I don't, we have, Similar to Warren's legacy, the direct descendants have just been completely eviscerated from the record, and they really do boast an impressive military succession. And even the current trustee of the copy painting at Museum of Fine Arts Boston is a Dr. Carolyn Matthews. She's at a Baylor University. She holds an annual Dr. Joseph Warren Prize and continues in the tradition of that medical dynasty. Now, in October 2016, the Freemasons of Massachusetts got together and dedicated a statue. They had the statue made and dedicated it to Forest Hills, where Warren is now. And it was a lovely ceremony back in 2016. And I'm just going to end off here. You know, again, I, I really hope that Warren is making some sort of a comeback, a renaissance. I hope mine is not the last book about him. I hope people are going to continue to do the research and come up with new information because it's definitely out there. And I just thought this was a nice way to leave off, to, to really honor Warren and those soldiers who gave their lives at, at the Battle of Bunker Hill. And it says, Immortals, honor to the illustrious dead, their monument is immortality. Thank you.